Though there are crazy things going out in this world, Father, we know who you are. The rock, steadfast, ever faithful. Lord, we sing your praise this morning. We worship you. We thank you. Um, God, as we spend time hearing your word, please teach our hearts. Open our hearts and our ears and our minds uh, to be taught by you this morning. Father, again, we praise you and love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. For your seated and welcome one another with a holy hand wave. Holy hand. Holy hand wave. All right. Let's see everybody here this morning. Get your Bibles if you will. We'll continue looking at Acts chapter 19. So turn there. While you're turning there, do you like the Christmas decorations? Yes. Hey, you got to thank the holidays and the foxes and, and Jim Sostack. They we're busy Wednesday night and did some things, and, and uh, we really appreciate all of the work. You ought to come by my office because it got connected with it too. It is the most unique, unusual. I opened the door this morning, but what elves have been here? And it's great. I really appreciate it. It's a lot of fun. All right, we're back to Acts. We're going to get through Acts in the coming weeks. We'll get there. We're going to finish it. This is a great chapter, and uh, so I want to divide it up, and we'll look at starting at verse 23 in just a few minutes. We're studying Acts, because this is where we learn what the church is all about, what they did, and how God provided direction for them. We learn about early Christianity, the struggles that they went through. And it's not just a historical kind of book. It is, what does it mean to us today? How are we struggling today? How do the things that we see 2,000 years ago still affect us today? Now we've been seeing as the gospel moved out from just a small band of people, 120 in the upper room, to now some 30, 40 years later, it is affecting the entire world. And we've especially been looking at Paul as he is traveling on his various mission journeys. We're on his third mission trip, and while he gets further and further away from Jerusalem, there's something that we've discovered along the way that is, has been a, a difficulty, but not something that he backs away from, and that's the issue of idols. He didn't have that trouble in Jerusalem, in Judea. He didn't have that trouble in the synagogues as he went around, because this was different in a different world. In the world that's beyond that, they have all kinds of gods and goddesses. You probably remember a few weeks ago when we were talking about Paul in Athens, and he preaches an entire sermon about the unknown God because of all the gods and goddesses that were there in the Areopagus, he begins to preach to them about the one true God. It's the, it's the God that he grew up with that separated the Jews from all the Gentiles in the rest of the world. In fact, look, look at this passage in Exodus chapter 20. It is the Ten Commandments, the first one. The very first commandment says, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. <clears throat> Do not have other gods beside me. Do not make an idol for yourself whether in the shape of anything in the heavens above or on the earth below or in the waters under the earth, do not bow and worship to them and do not serve them. This is the first of the Ten Commandments and it is the most important one. It lays a foundation for everything else where he tells the Jews, I am the only true God. Worship only me. And for the Jews, it is probably the greatest distinction that made them different from everyone else in the world. Because as they went out, remember, even at that time, long before that time, there were many gods and goddesses of all kinds, shapes and sizes over nature and over crops and over fertility. You name it, it was anything you needed, there was a god or a goddess. But God said to the Jews, I am the one true God. Worship only me. 
But as we go along in the Bible, do we find that the Jews were worshiping other gods? It's something I think that, that we're going to find out this morning. And then looking at this passage we're going to look at, talking about this one idol, is it possible that in 2020 that we, even Christians, but especially in the world, is it possible that we could also be guilty of worshiping idols? Yeah. It's a strange thing, but I think a real thing that we need to look at this morning. Well, let's look at the map. We've been using the map to kind of give you an idea, and it's hard to read that up there, but that circle right in the, about the middle of the map is a place called Ephesus. And Ephesus is a very important city, a large city. You see, it's a port city. It's a place where Paul spent over two years of his mission trip, which was unusual. Only one other place, Corinth, that he spent that amount of time. And while he was there, if you recall, in the, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at it, and there was a revival that broke out, basically in the people, the Gentiles of Ephesus, where the people, the magicians, and those that were relying, relying upon all kinds of gods and goddesses and magic and superstition, they took their books, went into the millions of dollars, they burned them on a big pile, and people became followers after the one true God. That became a major issue in Ephesus. So let's start off looking at verse 19, or verse 23 of chapter 19. Now what we're going to do this morning, we're going to kind of go through, <clears throat> it's a rather lengthy passage, but we're going to look through the passage, explain it a little bit, give you a little insight into what's going on. Then we're going to go back and look at how that applies to you and me, and what we can find um, learning from this passage 2,000 years ago, how it applies to us today. So let's start verse 23. I'm reading the NIV. It reads very well. So that's what I'm going to use this morning. About that time, there arose a great disturbance about the way. Now you notice that way is capitalized. They didn't use about Christianity because that really hadn't come into full fruition at that point. This is probably taken where Jesus said, I am the one. I am the way, the truth, and life. And so the followers of Jesus were the followers of the way. So a disturbance about those followers of Jesus, a silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, also known as Diana in Greek, brought a, in a lot of business for the craftsmen there. He called them together, along with the workers in related trades, and said, You know, my friends, that we receive a good income from this business. And you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that gods made by human hands are no gods at all. There is danger, not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited, and the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. And you see the problem here. Demetrius says, we got a problem here in River City. It's not a good place. Because Paul is messing with the goddess Artemis. Now, understand something. This was a very unusual setting. Artemis was a goddess that was especially revered in the city of Ephesus. In fact, they built a temple to her four times the size of the Parthenon in Athens. It was so large, so ornate... Even some of the scriptures said instead of using mortar, they used gold. I mean, it was incredible. In fact, it was the one, one of the seven wonders of the world. 
It was that well known all around the world. And Artemis was the goddess. That's kind of an odd thing. Now, Diana, if you look at the goddess Diana in Greek uh, goddess legend mythology, she's kind of a, a graceful goddess of, of the hunt, and you'll see her out there with uh, animals and so forth. And this is not the same, although it's the same goddess. They really did some strange things to her. They made her rather gross. They made her the god of fertility. She was, I, I looked at some statues, some ancient statues online, and they're filled with breasts, the whole, the whole entire body. It was kind of like, what kind of woman was this anyway? And it, because they were saying that she was very, uh, the goddess of being very fertile in your family, in your business, in your farming, whatever it might be. And um, if you want a good life, you worship Artemis. And there were 30, at least 30 cities in the region that were heavily invested in the cult of Artemis. And so once a year, for about a month, um, calendar month of the year, they celebrated her birthday, apparently, and we'll see a little bit later. It, it, some think that there was a meteor that came out of the sky sometime in the past that kind of looked a little like, or at least they made it look like her. And, and so whenever they said, well, this is when she came to earth, they celebrated her, her, her birth for an entire month. And as they did that, that people from all over the world, literally, would come and buy terracotta images of the temple, silver and gold images of Artemis, and they would take it home and make their own little temple there, bow down, sacrifice, do the whole thing. But those who made those little images made a good living. And Demetrius, probably the head of the guild, said, hey, this guy Paul is messing with us. He is saying that gods that are made by hand are not gods at all. That's going to have a problem. And look at all these guys that are used to be part of our cult and they're no longer with us. He was very upset because not only was he discrediting their gods, he was taking money out of their wallets. That was probably a lot more hurtful. Well, let's go on. In verse 28, when they, the people that, that Demetrius was talking to, when they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! And soon, the whole city was in an uproar. The, the people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and all of them rushed into the theater together. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. All right, well, let's see what's going on here. As he's talking and he gets the crowd worked up, they, they get really, really amped up. And they start shouting, greatest Artemis of the Ephesians, and they're ready for blood. And they filled this this large temple, this amphitheater that would seat 20 to 24,000 people. And as they came there, they were ready to do about anything to anyone who was opposing them. Can you imagine if Paul walked into that amphitheater and said, let me explain this. That would be an end of Paul. And so Paul wisely listens to the people in charge, the disciples, and some people called Asiarchs, who were some of the Roman provincial leaders that Paul had probably talked to and converted over. And they said, do not go there. Paul very wisely does not go there. Verse 32, let's keep going. The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people did not even know why they were there. 
The Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander to the front and they shouted instructions to him. He motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people. But when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. People started flooding in, people off the street. They didn't even know why they were there. They were just angry. Sounds a little like a political convention. They're just ready to, for somebody to really get it. And they don't even know why they're there. That judges people are angry because something's not right in my life. Kind of a mob mentality, pandering off the anger of those and the emotions of those who are there. And, and the Jews said, oh, we, we want to be innocent of this. This is Paul, not us. And so they get a guy by the name of Alexander. Can you imagine 20,000 people there? And they say, Alexander, you've got a good voice. Get up there. And he said, what? Do uh, you want me to do what? And they start saying, this is what we want you to do. Tell them it wasn't us. It's Paul. The hypocrisy is this. When the Ephesians saw that he was a Jew up there, they knew that they believed in just one God, not in many gods. And so they shouted him off the stage, get him out of here, and he left. Kind of a first century Twitter storm. They just did everything they could to get him off and get him away, and he got down very quickly. In comes a kind of unusual hero that saves the day in an unusual way. Verse 35. The city clerk quieted the crowd and said, Fellow Ephesians, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image, which fell from heaven? That's where that place where they thought it might have been a meteor. Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to calm down and not do anything rash. Uh, just a, for a pause there, remember that Rome let you be okay as long as you did not cause any problems. And the city was in an uproar. He said, we're going to get in trouble, guys, if you're not careful. You brought these men here. Though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddesses, if then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open, they, and there are proconsuls. Then they can press charges. If there's anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. As it is, we're in danger of being charged with rioting because of what happened today. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion since there is no reason for it. And after he said this, he dismissed the assembly. A very unusual ending to a mob by saying, hey guys, you're, the, you're at fall here, not them. Let's back off. And the end of the whole thing is just dispersion of the crowd. All right, you get the setting. Now let's kind of dig into it, kind of figure out how does it, how does it apply to us? Because a lot of times we look at scripture and say, that's okay, that's not me. But I think we'll see some things in here that may surprise us. Let me define it this way. First, the reason for idols. The reason for idols. Here is a, a truth. Everyone, literally everyone, worships something, period. Everyone is needing to find meaning, direction, purpose, and pleasure in our life. And as a result, whatever they find it will be, they will set their heart upon that and believe it and give them, even give their lives to it. Listen, even an atheist believes against a belief. I don't believe there is a God and that's my belief and I will set my life upon it. I believe that the man is all that there is and I will set my life upon it. And guess what? They worship that concept. One writer said that 
What you worship must give you six things that leads meaning, satisfaction, freedom, identity, hope, and justice. Now, if you begin to worship something, but there's always something underneath. There's always a sin, but there's a sin underneath the sin. So we can look at these people and say, well, they're just superstitious, and so they worship idols and so forth. But really, as, as Demetrius points out, what they're worshiping is something underneath that. For Demetrius, it's money. He said, look, if, 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 if they take us away, take our idols away, we're not going to have enough money to get by. And look, we're, we're fine craftsmen. We can't let this happen. So the idols are there, but the reason they're there is for money or power, or reputation, or prestige. All of those things are underneath the things that we are pursuing so that we can become more than we thought we could be. It's not just some primitive need to explain the unexplainable, but it was the fulfillment of their heart's longing to be something of worth in their lives and to others. See, idols are, are a reality, but that's not the thing. You, you may not have an idol in your home, but there's something possibly that you're seeking underneath what you're searching for. There's a reason for idols, but let me look at the, uh, the reality of idols also. You say, again, you're, you're barking up a, the wrong tree. I don't serve any idols. Come to my house today, you will not find any idols. It all doesn't apply to me. John Calvin years ago said, the heart is an idol factory. The heart is an idol factory. We're manufacturing idols all the time. Okay, then what is an idol? Let me give you this definition of what an idol is. Anything that is functionally most important to your happiness is your functional God, your idol. It turns good things into ultimate things. Anything that you are seeking that says, if I have this, I will feel good about my life. Let me read this quote from a book. Our contemporary society is not fundamentally different from these ancient ones. Each culture is dominated by its own set of idols. Each has its priesthoods, its totems, and rituals. Each one has its shrines, whether office towers, spas and gyms, studios or stadiums, where sacrifices must be made in order to procure the blessings of a good life and ward off disaster. What are the gods of beauty, power, money and achievement, but these same things that have assumed mythic proportions in our individual lives and in our society. I get this. We may not physically kneel before the statue of Aphrodite, but many young women today are driven into depression and eating disorders by an obsessive concern over their body image. We may not burn incense to Artemis, but when money and career are raised to cosmic proportions, we perform a kind of child sacrifice, neglecting family and community to achieve a higher place in business and gain more wealth and prestige. Did you get that? There are things in our lives that we are willing to sacrifice our lives for. If it's knowledge, you may sacrifice your time energy and money. You know people who are seeking after all kinds of educational goals and end up with two, three hundred thousand dollars in debt and a life that doesn't show much more than a, than a diploma. Or power. If you're after power and that's significant, you will sacrifice your integrity. If it needs to be done in order to get ahead, that's okay. Or if it is money, as I just read, you may sacrifice your family. Work 70 hours a week, never be available, never be home. Consider what Jesus 
told his disciples about sacrifice. Matthew 10, 37 says, Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who's, who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Do those words of Jesus stun you at all? The harshness? The division? Now, obviously, he's not saying you've got to hate these people. You've got to hate each other. That's not what he's saying. But he's saying the ultimate must not be your family. And the ultimate must be me. The sacrifice for my life and my direction must come first in your life. The sum of the idols is this. You simply don't see it. And now, back in that day, back in Paul's day, there were certainly idols you could see them. You could pick up a statue of Artemis. It was obvious. We don't have those things, or at least we don't in this room, I don't think. And so we say, well, I don't do that. That's not part of my life. It's a lot more subtle than like the commandments of lying, you know when you're lying. Stealing, you know you didn't put that in your basket. Adultery, if you wake up to somebody and say, who are you? I thought you were my wife. You know, that is not something you're going to mistake. In fact, we can be very religious, come to church, give to church, be involved in things, and be far removed from God. If you read the Old Testament prophets, and I hope that you will this next year, you'll find that time and time and time and time again, the prophet, God was speaking, the prophet said, I don't want your sacrifice. I don't want your burial offerings. I want you. I want your heart. You're acting religious. That's not sufficient. Remember the Pharisees. He said, you're, you're whitewashed tombs. You're clean on the outside, but on the inside, you're dead man's bones. Be unhypocritical. Be a person filled with integrity. Make sure that you are sacrificing only to me. Well, if we've got those in our lives, I've got to tell you, there are things in our lives that make it difficult for us to, um, to go through life and, and feel, I gotta have this thing. If I don't have this thing, I don't have anything. We need to be rescued from idols. So let's look at how, do we, or how are we rescued from idols. Being the very first of the Ten Commandments, I think it's there because idols are the most powerful thing that we have to be aware of that can affect and redirect our lives. It can empty us out. It can leave you with nothing. If you have an idol, if you have something in your life that you say, I've got to have this or I can't go on. Let me tell you, if you give your life to this and achieve your goal, when you achieve that goal, that idol will leave you empty. And if you fail, that idol cannot forgive you. It's interesting, as this story ends, it's an interesting way that it ends because unlike every other story where there was a conflict, Paul remains silent. It's the only time that it happens. But this man comes out, this official of the town comes out, and, and he says, guys, let's just, let's just make a political judgment here. I think many commentators say it was a subtle way of saying the, the emptiness of an idle, sacrificed life ends in compromise and emptiness. In fact, 2,000 years later, there's nothing left of Artemis and the seventh wonder of the world. The Old Testament, it's interesting how it describes the 
follower of God, the Jew, with idol worship, he says it's spiritual adultery. It's a serious problem because adultery in the Old Testament was a serious problem. It's what you're doing. You're giving yourself to something else, someone else. It is putting your life into the arms of another. In the Old Testament, God puts it this way to Israel. He says, I will divorce you. But then he says, and I will bring you back. Remember the story of Hosea and Gomer? And he divorces, she leaves him, and then buys her back and brings her back. You see, the price of adultery in the Old Testament was death. They would take the one, the woman primarily, out in front of the people. Remember Jesus and the woman caught in adultery. The same deal. They would bring them out into a judging area and they would begin to stone that person because adultery was that significant. There was another crowd. But there was another crowd. And they wanted payback. They wanted payback for the one who said, I am the Son of God. And I want you to understand that God said, I will divorce you, but I will bring you back. How can he do that? Because on that day at Calvary, there were the shouting for the death of the Son who is the true husband, the true spouse in our lives. There was a death because of spiritual adultery. Jesus himself goes to the cross and gives his very life for us so that we could be released from the deceit of the idols. If you want to be released from the power of idols, if you want to live a life not pulled down by the things of this world. It says, if I don't have this, I am nothing. If I don't have this, I'm not just sad, I'm destroyed. If you want that, you have to begin on a daily basis to see the love of God in Jesus Christ, hung on the cross, laid in a tomb, dead because of your sin and because of your, his love for you. Let me read another passage. Titus chapter 3. I love this passage. At one time, we, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We were enslaved to idol worship. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. When the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that having been justified by grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. And I want, you, I want you to stress these things. I want you to think about these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. Man, you want to be released so that when things go wrong in your life, you lose your health. You lose those that you love. You lose your job. You, you're threatened in so many ways. You want to be able to stand up and say, it's okay. It's because my ultimate is not that. My ultimate is God. And I know that by grace I've been saved by faith. And if you gain Him by faith, you at the end will be satisfied. Welcome in my good and faithful servant. And if you fail him, he can and will forgive you. What are the things in your life? I mean, this is one of those things that 
It's, it, it's an inner perspective as well. One of those things in your life that if they're taken away, you say, man, I just can't live with that. I, I, I'm so angry and dis, distraught and depressed and bitter. I'm like one of those people that just I'm shaking a fist. You know, we, we can be caught up in things and not realize the grace, the love, the mercy, the hope, the life that we have in Jesus Christ. So this morning, my plea for me and for you, identify those things, own up to them, and begin to let God release you from those things so that the life of sacrifice is primarily directed towards a life with God. So I thought we'd end this morning just a little different with the song. Just, just us. We're going to do it first century style with no piano and organ. So let's sing this little song. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul. Rejoice. And let's sing it with the joy that God has given to us because we know he is the one true God. frightened at times, unwilling to trust you at times. And we've recognized that it's, an, it's something that we've been depending upon. God, may we depend upon you when everything goes wrong. May we look to you and say, you are the one that loves me above all things. You're the one that will give me life and joy and peace and security. You are the one that welcomes me into your home, not because of us, but because of your grace and sacrifice. And may we be willing this week to sacrifice for the ultimate, which is you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Venus Smith. Great to see you all this morning.